um, and now CEO, um, now CEO of Southeast London Community Energy. Um, and ever since our inception as an organisation, we've done a lot of work, what we have called energy justice work. And I think it was really part of our vision as an organisation that actually, not only did we want to see a renewable distributed low carbon system, but we also wanted to see one that left no one behind. And that we felt that actually, um, you know, if this energy transition doesn't, uh, doesn't enable all of our residents, be their whatever income, um, to meet their energy needs, then we didn't want any, any part in that transition. So it, it was really about, um, it was really a central part of my organization's um, mission and narrative as to uh, what we wanted to see in an energy system. Um, so we started off very small, um, just doing some little bits of energy advice um, locally, some workshops, and then we gradually grew. Currently, um, we employ a team of six energy advisors um, and we do a whole range of stuff. Um, so today was really about myself and Alex. Now I'm sure I'll let, shall I introduce Alex? Um, Alex was yeah. also a founder member of Celsi, but long before she became a director of Celsi, she'd been work working in the fuel poverty space. Um, uh, has got to in terms of developing any fuel poverty services. Um, Duncan. Uh, hello, Duncan Law, working for Community Energy England, but also found a member of Brixton Energy and Repowering. Uh, Repowering are active. I'm not involved with that. Um, I ha We used to have um, action on energy doing draft busting, a phrase that was invented just about outside Brixton. I'm trying to do some stuff with my local community, uh, but have really I'm at stage one. Perfect. And Bill? So I'm going to talk about, whilst Catherine's enabling me to share some slides, I'm going to talk about the, uh, what we're going to be doing over these two Mondays. This is a course very, very, very specifically for practitioners, people who run organisations who currently uh, don't do work um, alleviating field poverty, but who would like to do that. Um, so um, it really is very, very practical um, and very much about um, enabling you as an, your, your organization to get going with that particular agenda. Um, so yeah, uh, it's over where we want to get to is by the end of the course for you to be able to have designed um, and know how to deliver Hey, Alex, how are you doing? You joined us. Know how to deliver a fuel poverty alleviation program. Um, and, oh, is that working? Sorry, I'm just trying to share my slides and I've got a very strange slide come up from the start. We Let can try see again. They're not in presentation mode, but we can see them. Yes. Hang on a minute. Let me put it in presentation mode. Go on. There we go. <laughs> so where we're aiming to get to is to enable you to design, deliver a service that meets the needs of your um, local community and fills the gap. Um, my co-presenter, Alex, has just joined. Alex, would you like to introduce yourself? I would. <laughs> now I'm finally flipping here. Apologies, everybody. <laughs> I couldn't get my computer to log out of my Celsi ecosystem to get into my personal ecosystem to then access my Eventbrite ticket. Oh, I've been so stressed out. Anyway, I'm very glad to be here. Um, I'm a co-founder, voluntary director still for Celsi. It's been one of several community energy organisations I've been involved with. At the moment, I'm doing a part-time contract for Community Energy London as the Fuel Poverty Lead. I've been doing, oh gosh, 18 years, about 
uh, delivering and working on sustainable energy and fuel poverty issues. And I will now get back on track with actually going through this course. So thank you, G, for holding the fort. That's fine. That's fine. We do a good tag teaming thing when we do stuff together. Thank goodness. <laughs> So today what we're going to be looking at is really um, enabling you to get an understanding of what fuel poverty is. Um, we're also going to use the term fuel, fuel stress, to give you an understanding of the difference. But we also want to give you an understanding of what types of help you can give, in what kinds of way, what your options are for delivery. Um, and also um, have a little bit of an understanding of where you get funding from. Um, Next week, we're going to follow up with um, a lot of the detail about, for example, how do you record data? How do you take case notes? What do you, you, have, to, you have to think about safeguarding and uh, you know, protecting your clients, um, thinking about data protection, thinking about um, all of those more in more detail about exactly how you get funding, how do you monitor and evaluate? So all of those things, it, you know, um, run it, all of those things that you'll need to know to be able to deliver a project will be going through in a little bit more detail next week. But today is really broad brush to get you to give you an understanding of what the options are um, in terms of the needs of your community. Alex, do you want to? Are you, do you feel ready to take over, or shall I carry on? Two minutes, right? So, fuel poverty, fuel stress. Um, so the term fuel poverty um, is bandied around a lot, but fuel poverty really refers to that convergence of circumstances where an individual has a low income, but also they have an inefficient home. So um, they have a home that essentially leaks heat, so that doesn't retain the heat. So therefore they end up spending a lot of money on energy, they have high energy costs. So essentially it's a conglomeration of those three issues. Um, it is not restricted to older, any type of person, older or younger person. It is, it is a facet, it is a facet of vulnerability. Um, it is a type of vulnerability. Um, there are two different, there, there are several legal def or official definitions of this. The term fuel stress used to be what we, how we termed fuel poverty, how we define fuel poverty. Someone who is in fuel stress is someone who spends more, 10% or more of their income on energy. And they, and, or alternatively, um, if they were to heat their home adequately, they would spend 10% or more of their income. Many people don't spend 10% of their income. It's only because they don't turn their heating on and they, uh, and they don't use all the appliances that they would expect for daily life. The term fuel poverty um, is defined in the following way. Um, the official definition is called LILI. That stands for low income, low energy efficiency. Um, so in order to be fuel poor, somebody has to uh, have a lower than average income and higher than average energy, uh, sorry, lower than average energy efficiency in their home. Now, I won't go into the, uh, the, the where's and what for's of this definition, but essentially you're gonna need to decide for yourself who is fuel poor. You could determine it um, as using these official definitions. Gee, the slides aren't moving as you're speaking. I haven't moved a slide yet. That's why then, okay. No, I'm still on this first slide. Carry on. Jolly good. <laughs> and do chip in. Um, but essentially you can have a subjective definition using these, these, these official definitions uh, according to the government, fuel stress, they're spending or would have to spend more than 10% of their income if they were to heat their home adequately. Or um, this uh, definition of uh, Lily definition. Quite a lot of people end up using what's an objective definition of someone people self-define as fuel poor. If they're struggling, they call themselves fuel poor. 
and the, 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 the organization accepts that they are feel poor. And it's, in practice, that's what we do as an organization. If somebody comes to us saying that they are struggling, we will, we will treat them as such. Alex, are you ready? Only if you move the slides to the I right one. I have now, I have. No, they're not, you have them. Um, uh, can you not see target user group? No, nope. it's still in the um, PowerPoint mode of, um, not the presentation mode, so it's still on that first one. Okay, let's share again. Ah, uh, yeah, now we can see that. Oh, totally this is one of my, my favourite ones. Okay, so, um, so it's all very well, you know, let the academics and policy wonks argue about how to define things and you know the numbers are almost meaningless when you're talking about oh is it 5.5 billion or 5.6 million in fuel poverty the the end of the day more people are out there struggling even on days like this that kids are getting washed in cold water old people are eating cold food because they can't afford to use their electricity or put hot water on now we can break them down into segments of who we want to try and target <laughs> um, the most to help. And they're on a kind of sliding scale of severity or the impact that we can have by doing um, fuel poverty, energy advice and advocacy projects. Um, Dee and I have always kind of chuckled going, oh yeah, who are we gonna, how are we gonna target the fuel poor this winter and this, this season to kind of get at them? Um, but essentially there are more people now at this blue end of the scale, confidently coping who have kind of moved up a couple of notches. So they might be having less need historically, but now they might, and maybe before they might have been interested in reducing their carbon footprint by using less energy or being more aware about conserving energy. But now they've slid up into the at risk of, or by anyone's definitions, they're in clearly in fuel poverty or fuel stress. I saw Catherine's comment in the chat about the NEA, and we do take a breakdown of how the NEA define it and how the government currently define it. But essentially, it's a big problem. It's been getting bigger. And at the moment, it's at astronomical levels. Like, this is a kind of alternative reality that I'm living in that now everybody and anybody is talking about, oh gosh, I'm really worried about the energy prices. Every other day, one of the news headlines, there it is. Now, when we look at breaking these people down, there are people that feel this more acutely than just people that could be in work, but still worried about paying their energy bills or not having um, more than one shower a, a week. Um, it could be that they've been thrown into this as we break down here looking at it could be people that are in charge of energy bills for the first time or they've come to this country and they can't get their head around our energy system in care or in sheltered accommodation so basically they just need some um, support getting set up and getting good habits in from the start then it shifts through as you can see the different categories and how you can kind of intervene to alleviate things for them right through to people with high need at the other end of the scale. They could be asylum seekers, people with low digital, um, what's the right word? of the, Digital uh, inclusion. I was gonna say literacy, but that will do too. Thank you. Um, it could be that English is their second language. Um, it could be all sorts of reasons, but this group is growing. I was telling Dee earlier on, I was talking, I spoke to a teacher in a food bank uh, not, not that long ago about that they are worried about paying their um, energy bills or food. So we target these groups to work with, um, but quite often they're also the ones that have been let down <laughs> disappointed, shoved from pillar to post, um, ripped off, and they often pay more for their energy. So they are the most deserving of any interventions that we come up with. Next slide. Come on, next one, oh, go on, next one. 
Aha. Now, even though it's very old now, compar comparatively, the report there on the right hand side, the health impacts of cold homes and fuel poverty, the Marmot Review team, it still required reading pretty much. It's a lot of the, some of the, you know, facts and stats will be out, very out of date now, but everything it talks about in there about the scale of the problem and what we need to do is pretty much still relevant. And it's a problem that's been talked about in this country probably since the 70s, um, but we've kind of ignored it. Yes, we've got old housing stock. Yes, we've, we don't very often get, you know, minus 30 in, in the winter, um, but it, it kills people basically. And we'll have a look a bit that how that actually um, impacts on people. Because most people think, oh, we don't hear that many people getting hypothermia these days. Well, it's not that, it's quite a long, horrible journey before people actually die of hypothermia. So the World Health Organization says that for vulnerable people, the main living area should be between 18 and 21 degrees. So basically that means there's no threat to their health. Below 16 degrees or so, actually I've got, a, oh, I meant to plug it in, but I got held up with trying to make the blinking computer and IT work properly. Um, so um, below 16 degrees, you get a re reduced resistance to respiratory issues, basically. Oh, there's a nice report that um, uh, Catherine's just put in, but if you, know, you wanna go off and do your own deep dive on this stuff, other sources of really good information would be looking at the NICE guidelines, um, which are basically, we have finally got them recognized. Oh gosh, it must be getting on for seven or eight years ago now. Um, actually recognize that there's guidelines telling the NHS what they need to do to offset the issues caused by cold homes. So if you've got anyone got asthma or COPD or anything like that, even just recovering from flu, I actually got um, pneumonia a couple of years ago, um, right at the beginning of COVID, we don't know if it was actually COVID, but um, I was definitely aware that when the heating wasn't on and it was colder, it was more difficult to breathe. Um, and so that can exas exacerbate these existing conditions. Below 12 degrees, you've got that increase in blood pressure and blood viscosity. How does that translate? That's why we see more heart attacks and strokes in the winter than we do in the summer. In fact, the NHS can predict two, five and 10 days after there's been a cold snap, that in A&E, they'll see an increase of people with breathing difficulties and having heart attacks and increased trips and falls and all of this good stuff. So they know to kind of gear up for it because they're going to be inundated. Because it's not until you get to below nine degrees for like two or more hours that you get that the core temperature dropping. And then that's when you get might you might get people dying of hypothermia. It's not just about comfort, it's about health. And it costs about 1.8 billion, I think was the last that I saw how much it costs the NHS every year. So this isn't just a comfort thing. And yes, it is an environmental thing, being more savvy with the energy that we've got, but it's also about a people thing to keep people healthy and comfortable. Next slide. So we have a whole list of people that are the most risk of fuel poverty and... By most at risk, we mean most... Now, I hate to put this crudely, most likely to die Yeah. if they get cold. Mm -hmm. But before we tell you, would anyone like to have a go? Hazard a guess. At who might... What kinds of people might be on the list? Catherine. So this is most likely to die. Yeah. So if they, so uh, if by most at risk, yeah. Whose health is most at risk? Um, Kinds of people. people. Sorry. Elderly people. Yep. Older. Older. Older yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? People on universal credit. Yes. Good one, Sydney. Yes. Uh, Duncan, is that you with a hand? No. Disabled. Disabled, yeah. yes. 
people with disabilities, yes. And long-term health conditions. Linda. I was going to ask about young children as yes. well. Yeah. Yep, under fives. Yeah. Especially yep. babies because they can't regulate their own temperature as well. Yeah, good one. Yep, and there is some horrible stats about um, if you've been cold when you're uh, age under five, how that affects you throughout your life. Yeah, even the research that shows the effect it has on attainment and how kids do well at school or not. Basically, there's a massive correlation. <laughs> the more the more feel poor poverty you're in the lower you are at the end on the educational achievement list so it's yeah. it's pretty yeah. rubbish across the board frankly yeah any other thoughts mm. is okay. would, would one be um like single parents because i read something about how so many don't put it on when they're in the house on their own and they wait until the kids are home yeah if they'd be at risk of dying Yes, certainly of the families, children of the people of the families, uh, those most at risk are the sing, uh, lone parent families. Mm. Yeah. So here's here's the list according to Nice. Not yeah. very nice. Nice is the National Institute of Clinical Excellence. Um, Not a very nice list. The ones I want to point out that people don't often realise is the in transition. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of the worst cases we've seen are people who are leaving care, leaving prison, leaving, um, often coming out of homelessness. There's a bit of a what? There's there's a bit of a cycle with homelessness that a lot of people are rehoused by organisations working really hard to rehouse them, but people just can't cope with the bills and they go back to homelessness. Um, so migrants, asylum seekers, people who are not literate, are people who struggle with languages. So. We've talked about people with health conditions. What health conditions? Would anyone like to hazard a guess? So what, who is most risk of, so we've talked about this process whereby living in a cold home uh, or indeed living in an overheated home can have the same effect. Uh, living in an overly warm or overly heated home um, exacerbates existing gave you some pointers with the thermometer slide a minute ago see who's taking notice anyone like to hazard a guess cardiovascular yeah. respiratory cardiovascular respiratory yay any others one we didn't mention that's been getting a lot more attention lately thank goodness mental health issues because putting it fun <laughs> even if you don't suffer from depression being in a cold home is blinking miserable not to make light of it um so any mental health condition pretty much or learning difficulty is exacerbated again by being in a cold home or being stressed about not being able to pay your bills very good any other thoughts anyone got any other thoughts before i press the button that reveals the list. Da, da, da. So respiratory, we got that. Cardiovascular, we got that. Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is one of those categories that people often forget. Any condition where you may not be sensitive to the cold, where you may not be in a state of mind to recognize that you are dangerously cold. Um, ME, fibromyalgia, cancer, um, osteoarthritis. You know, people with arthritis hate to, live, hate to be in a cold home. It makes it worse. I'm not even going to try and sell, say the uh, collective noun for sickle cell and thalassemia. Um, Good and, call. Yeah. Yeah. Severe yeah. Even obvious ones like uh, my friend's got a heart condition and it gives her Raynaud's. And so her fingers often go blue or black. Um, now that might be the more obvious one, but the fact that you have got depression might be the less obvious one, but it's a whole raft of things that are made worse. And that's why it's important that we do projects like this. And why we're so happy that all of you have come along to learn how to do this. 
Oh, yes, an autoimmune. Ah, lupus, one. yeah. Arthritis. Oh, ha! what happened there to my slide? Have I slow shown the wrong slides? Yes. I have shown the wrong slides. I'm going to stop sharing and find the right slides very calmly. Because <laughs> I'm not sure what happened there. Um, just let me check. Um, so, but while I'm looking for the right slides, um, what we'd like to do is just have a think about what's happened. So what we're telling you is the, the, um, the tale, this is the, the, this is the story we've been telling for years and years. However, there's an awful lot happened recently. Um, and for years, it used to be the case that the people that came to us were, were the people we've been talking about here, the people with long-term health conditions, the people who are older, younger. It's changed. So the people that are typically coming to us for help are not necessarily the people uh, that we've been talking about. Um, who do you think they might be? Anyone got any suggestions? Are any of you in that category? Single parents? Yeah. So, single parents are one of them. So what has happened recently is that actually fuel poverty has moved beyond the obvious, uh, the, the, the obvious subjects, um, the people we've been talking about. And actually, the people who we're seeing more of are typically people on benefits, uh, people who, um, uh, people who are working but on minimum wage um, or people who are, um, who are, are really struggling um, with, oh, sorry, I'm trying to get my slideshow working. It, could be, from, it could be from the legacy from the, the benefit uplift dropping off or it could be they were made redundant under the, during the you know the worst of the pandemic there's a whole variety of reasons that have pushed a lot more people into this category and it, it might be that you know they've never really thought about their energy bills before it was almost just like a, a tax like you just have to pay and you can't control very much and you just don't really think about it but suddenly the context of the kind of landscape around energy and their personal circumstances have convened in a big evil, um, horrible confluence where they've ended up and now they find themselves in a position having to look at, wow, you know, can we have, can we have a shower this evening? Um, So I'm going to ask You're you, what do I do here to get my slides to show in presentation mode? I'm clicking from beginning and it's not letting me do it. They are in presentation I... mode now. So maybe if you just use the arrow, it will change. Ah, jolly good. It's not, <laughs> it's not showing me I'm in presentation mode. Okay. Yep, they're moving. All good. Yeah. There we go. Teamwork making the dream work. There we go. Sorry, I've got to get to the slide now. I've put all the... <laughs> Quite I told obvious. you not to put all the animations on them. It takes ages. <laughs> okay, so, so let's have a little bit of a chat about what's recently happened. Let's start at the very beginning. Let's do the let's do the narrative. So, um, I don't know if everyone realizes, but I'm, we've got a bunch of energy nerds here. But I'm sure, so I'm sure you all do realize that um, essentially the energy system is made up of people that generate energy, they mine gas, uh, they mine uh, fuel, or, or they, potentially they generate renewables. But you've got generators, you've got people who distribute um, the energy, and you've got companies that supply. What recently happened? Um, um, can anyone tell me why energy prices recently went up? Which version do you want, G? Sorry? Do, do tell you want me, the tell me the, version the honest version or the real yeah. version? Real version. 
Are we on Brexit and Ukraine war? <laughs> yep. Brexit and Ukraine war. Ukraine war. What happened to make? Well, essentially, what happened to the availability of um, uh, gas and electricity on the wholesale markets, or particularly gas? It became more scarce. So essentially, for a variety of factors, um, there was limitations in the supply of electricity uh, of, of gas. Um, we can talk about the UK war. That's 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 only a minor factor, but many many factors converged. Um, one of which is uh, increase in demand from uh, the Asian market. Um, a very long winter, uh, the previous winter, um, low wind. I could I could go on, but there were a variety of factors that made. Uh, uh, that, that caused scarcity um, in supply. Scarcity of supply put the wholesale prices up. Wholesale prices went up. Can anyone tell me what the price cap is? The one then, Alex. You're, <laughs> you're meant to be co-presenting. <laughs> but yes, All right. Tell me what Duncan the price put cap his is. hand up. Sorry. Duncan, put his hand up. Jolly good. Tell me what the price cap is. Sorry, Alex. <laughs> it's the maximum amount the uh, energy suppliers are allowed to charge customers on average. That's right, for particular types of tariff. So your standard variable tariff or your prepayment meter tariff. Yes, so it, this is the tariff that 50% of people are on. Um, they essentially capped it. Um, so Ofgem determines what the price should be. What the price cap was set in about, uh, in about June last year. When did prices go up? Wholesale prices go up. April. August last year. Mm. Prices went up in August. Sorry. Then what happened? And we got an increase in bills in April. We got an increase in bills in April. You also got one what? in October. What happened to energy companies? 26 of them. They went bust. Yep, yeah, they went bust. So Ofgem set the price, uh, the price cap. Essentially, they set it lower than, um, they set the price cap lower than energy companies were able to afford to sell it to you. So wholesale prices went up, whole load of energy, price, uh, energy companies went bust. 26 of them in total went bust simply because the energy price, the, the, the price cap had been set too low them for them to be able to recoup their costs of buying the, the electricity and gas from the wholesale markets. Prices went up in October. What happened again in February? What happened to the price cap in February? Went up again. Yeah, so the price cap was set again in February. Ofgem was very, very scared this time about setting it too low. So how much did it increase by the price cap? 54%. 54%, that's right. So that meant for anyone who was on a standard variable tariff, um, who hadn't fixed their price, or, or anyone who was with an energy company who'd gone bust and was transferred to a new energy company and to their standard variable tariff, their energy prices went up 54% in April. What's gonna happen in October? going to go up again yeah that's right it's going to go up again in october so alex tell us what's going to happen to fuel poverty I'll pass over to you to do this slide thank you very much so i am the bearer of bad news um the nea uh, predicting that the impact of the 54 percent so first of all they were predicting 25 percent and then a couple of weeks ago they went oh no hang on a second that's a bit too conservative. It's probably going to be 50, uh, no, it was four, 54, no, 42%, 42, sorry. I'm a bit dyslexic. I apologize in advance when I get my numbers muddled up. Um, so with this new prediction of what's going to happen with the um, costs is that that's going to plunge 6.5 million UK households into fuel poverty more, uh, and, a, and it, of an increase over 40%. Now, this looks like a 2.5 million 
rise in the amount of people who are in fuel poverty and it's when I started doing this work a long time ago we were looking at it actually declining to the point that it was not quite negligible but it was stereotypical granny sat in front of one bar fires and that kind of thing um if you told me a I'd still be doing this work <laughs> at this age and b because at that time it was enshrined in law that we were er eradicating fuel poverty and it was on the well on the way but now fast forward to 2022 and here we are we're looking this winter at an absolutely astronomical rise and this looking at the NEA figures is more realistic and even then I think they're fairly conservative um, based on our kind of lived experience of being out there and seeing the kind of huge demand on energy advice projects I don't just talk to sales I talk to quite a few different organizations um, across London and in the southeast doing work like this and projects like this or community groups or even tenants groups or you know gardening groups was the last, one of the last ones or transition town groups so they can go well there's a wider variety of different people and there's a wider variety of reasons now what are we going to do yes we've got the top down approach which on the next slide we'll have a quick look at um but then we've got the <laughs> The, from the grassroots because we're embedded in our local communities whether we realize it or not whether it's you know people we see at the library or um parents groups or tap dancing classes or whatever it is we have those links into our local community um and it's never been as topical before to actually talk about what's available there's lots of confusion out there that people are basically scared because they see all these headlines they don't quite understand things like the price cap and wholesale energy markets and um that, that they've seen all these numbers saying how much a huge increase and they start to self-disconnect i.e not use um services they need to for a kind of reasonable comfortable lifestyle um and the government, yes, a couple of weeks ago when they announced the not 25% prediction for October, it, Martin Lewis's his website, the Money Saving Expert, is the second most used uh, website in the UK about, over and above, or oh, just behind BBC News. And he normally, I think he's normally, normally sort of holds him back a little bit of dealing with government departments especially I think because he's his background's a financial journalist but he sort of swore and stormed out of a meeting with Ofgem because he couldn't you know quite believe the absolute nonsense and disgusting state of affairs so we have seen things in the new uh, the, the government's latest raft of offerings which is where they're looking at offering instead of a 200 pound refer uh sort of loan that we were offered that we'd have to pay back over five years um, now they're looking at a 400 pound um, payment but that rebate is basically from um, what they're not calling a windfall tax that's a whole other workshop to talk about that um, but what we are looking at um, is more targeted support which is better than a poke in the eye with a sharp stick but what's behind all of this even when you looked at the maximum amount that people are going to be better off by i.e that top bracket there of 650 pounds we're still looking at essentially in the last year to year and a half that people's energy costs have probably gone up by twice that and that's based on the average bill uh, which is then based on a kind of three bed semi but some people have got you know one bedroom bed sits and other people have got you know <laughs> seven children and five bedrooms in the house so you know across the board let's keep it in perspective but again we've got this so it, well, those people that might have been 
just about managing and sliding into fuel pool, they might now be back at the risk of it rather than actually in it. But still for those people that are struggling financially, they're still not gonna be any better off. Next slide. Well, they will, but. Yeah, I mean, I think it's worth summarizing here that essentially what we've had is we've had an exponential growth in fuel poverty um, that, um, that actually started in October, but people started talking about it in April when there was a big jump. Um, and actually what we've got is we've got an increase in the number of people uh, experiencing fuel stress as well as fuel poverty. Um, and, uh, and a huge widening of, uh, of what we as organizations are required to respond to. So the next session is really gonna be about how do you target? So basically you as an organization, if you're gonna do fuel poverty alleviation work, you cannot do everything. There is no way, and it's a discussion we've been having in Celsi uh, a lot, that we simply cannot respond to demand. One of the first decisions you're gonna have to make is how do you target your service? Who are you targeting your service on? And, um, and what criteria are you using for that, uh, for that targeting? So we're gonna give you some criteria uh, some some um, some ways, some heuristics, I guess, for targeting, for deciding who you're going to work with, who you're going to provide help to, because there's no way you can provide help for everyone. So, three ways. The first is where are there gaps in provision? There are a number of organizations working in this area. Some of them are local authorities. So for example, Croydon provides, provides energy advice. Uh, there are some big organizations like Groundwork London or the Citizens Advice who provide energy advice. And there are other community groups for me by Bow Center, Heat is one in London. Um, in addition, housing providers sometimes provide energy advice. Um, be skeptical though because actually a lot of organizations have for years and years only provided very high level <laughs> advice. They've helped people switch um, providers. They've helped people change from a prepayment meter to a, a credit meter that's a cheaper way. Um, they've helped people get the warm home discount. All of these things are easy wins. None of those things are available anymore. You can't switch energy providers and get anyone savings because there aren't savings to be had. There's very little volatility in the market. Um, the warm home discount is now the responsibility of energy providers. They're... So be skeptical. If it's an organization that just gives the very high level advice, probably they're not doing enough. So and, they the certainly first... won't, and they certainly won't be au fait with the current grants for big measures landscape or energy efficiency behavior change stuff either. Yeah. So who, where are the gaps in provision is a question that you need to ask yourself as an organization. Um, there's no point in trying to compete against an established organization like Groundwork London. If they've got their, if they've, <laughs> if they've well and truly got, um, I don't want to say claws, but <laughs> <laughs> they were well and truly embedded on the ground and they've got the relationship with the local authority. Don't try and compete against them. Find something different to do to what they're doing or find a different area to do it in. Um, and indeed, you don't want to be duplicating provision. There's enough fuel poverty. No around. need, no need. Um, the second heuristic you can use is one based on geography. Um, so if you remember at the start of the session, I talked about uh, Lily as a means of measuring fuel poverty. Um, the government provides statistics that are admittedly two years old. Well, we were impressed that it'd gone up from 2017. Let's face it, earlier on when we double checked the link, we were like, oh, it's only 2019, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> the government provides um, data on 
few, how many few poor, this is based on some calculations that look at the number of people who are on a lower income and the number of people who are living in energy efficient homes. They calculate the number of people that are fuel poor and they do it in uh, down to the level of the LSOA. Do people know what LSOA is? Uh, a lower super output area. It's a very small level of geography. So you could look to see where fuel poverty is most prevalent in your local area and look to develop services for those particular areas. Um, how do you find out where uh, about these statistics? Well, there's a very nice tool here that I've created a picture of. Um, it's called it's it's, a, it's called Parallel. You can see um, a visual representation here of fuel poverty across South London, where the higher the bar, the greater the levels of fuel poverty. So, which areas are particularly in fuel poverty in this little snap I've taken here? Honor Oak. Honor Oak's pretty bad. Yeah. Um, somewhere upper, in the yeah, upper Sydney, pretty bad. Is that Woodcote at the back? Uh, yep. Yep, Woodcote's really high. That's near yeah. you, isn't it? Yeah, that's near me. I did not know that. Anyway, so take a look at, I've given, well, we, we will be giving you these slides. Take a look at Parallel and have yeah. a have a snoop about. And obviously, we know some of you are not from London, so we've slight, been slightly biased. But they, so the London Data Store at, uh, link won't be applicable for you, but there will be the equivalent for you wherever you are in the UK. Do you know what? I think I've realised. I'm very sorry. Big bars are the ones with low levels of fuel poverty, and the low bars are the ones with high levels of fuel poverty. Um, yeah, that makes more sense to what I know of my yeah. idea. <laughs> apologies, apologies, apologies. It's a while since I've looked at these tools. Um, also, sub-regional uh, fuel poverty stats are available on the government website. They list it by LSOA, and LSOA is listed by a code number. You need to, you probably need to look look at the government statistics alongside an LSOA map. And I provided an LSOA data uh, a map for London, but if you're outside London, you're just going to have to do a Google search for a map in your area. These come in handy, for example, if you were doing a funding bid or if you wanted to look at where would be a really good location to do a pop up energy advice service or something like that. Yeah. So the last criteria you could use is a partner. So one of the real challenges here, and I, and I should I really need to emphasize it, this is the challenge with de developing a fuel poverty service is not just to give good advice. It is to be able to reach the people who most need it. Reaching the and hard fact, to reach. Yeah. And in fact, um, a lot of the hard to reach are, you know, they're not people who will come forward to access services. So one of the criteria you could use to think about what exactly are we going to do, who are we going to target is, is there a partner you can work with? So in my organization, we've worked with groups of older people's organizations. We've worked with children's centers. Currently, we're working with a range of community groups that um, um, and we're training them to deliver fuel the, the sort of high level stuff. Have you got a partner? Um, I know that um, you, you guys up in North London, Sydney, you did some interesting work with a community center. <laughs> um, so have you got a partner that has um, that's able to reach those most at risk of fuel poverty. And quite often you could talk to a handful of people in your local area and it might, you know, for example, I know in my, up the road for me, there's a brilliant carers. Carers Greenwich are amazing and they're really active. Whereas in next door boroughs, they don't even have any support provision for carers. So depending on, you know, who's active in your local area and actually doesn't just have a shiny website going, oh, look at us, we're great. But also reputationally, they actually get out there and really care about what they're doing and are helping people. But it might, it probably won't be in energy advice so far. It could be anything from empowering tools or um, income maximization or a food access project. It could be all sorts of things. Yeah. And yeah, food banks make great partners. Yeah, because they quite often have very, very little capacity to do things, um, but are often dealing with energy advice. They're often asked about uh, these issues. So 
little exercise for you. If you saw the next slide while well, I passed it on, sorry, you'd have had a sneak preview <laughs> of what the answers are. But here's an exercise for you. Grab a pen and paper. What I'd like you to do is list all the ways in which you think and um, uh, an energy advisor could support a client. So that's the exercise. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to take a 10 minute break while you can get a cup of tea. And we're going to make that a 15 minute break so that you could uh, have a go at that exercise. So the X, I'll repeat it. So imagine you're an energy advisor. What I'd like you to do is list all the things, all the ways in which you could possibly help a client. Did that I've make just, sense? I've just noticed something. Mm -hmm. um, this, our, our session is two hours long, but somehow on the advert, it's an hour and a half. Oh. So 15 minutes would take okay. us up to <laughs> leaving us three minutes before some people might have a plan to leave. All right. Let's not do a 10 minute break. Do the exercise. But also take five minutes. To Are have a comfort break and grab a fish in five minutes. <laughs> Does anyone not understand the exercise? Can you just write it in the chat? I would, yeah. I'm not quite sure I've got the wording right. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. So you the exercise. Types, types of advice as opposed to ways in which you could approach. So I'm going to give you an example of a type of advice, a thing that you could do to support someone. Help them switch from a prepayment meter to a credit meter. That is a type of help, a, a way in which you could help. I find it useful to think it in terms of an outcome what could have happened after having um, a chat with an energy advisor. So it might be that they, um, I won't give another example because he's given one, but it would be like as a result of interacting with one of your energy champions or advisors that the um, client can walk away with as a result. So we're not talking about, um, you know, if we're talking about telephone advice or an energy advice cafe, we're talking about an energy related outcome that somebody could achieve having had the support and in, input from an energy advisor. Is that is that a bit clearer? We'll yeah. do a slide for this next time. Yes, we had a little bit of a confusion on our slides when we were pre preparing them. So. Um, and a few of them got prepared in haste um, a few minutes before the session. So um, I'll see, see you in five minutes. Yeah. yeah I was just um, five minutes of thinking time would be really useful rather than listening. Yes. Cool. Thanks. Yes. I'll stay on though because it'll be my penance for having a technical snafu. And if anyone has any questions.
I think that is five minutes, isn't it? My slides presenting. They haven't gone back to the beginning, have they? They're not in presentation mode, but we can see them. Oh. Just press from current slide. Yeah, I have done that. Hmm. I should it, be right. it, does it? it looks it looks oh. fine. Try double tapping the from current slide G. It's perfectly readable, G. Yeah, it it's, it's okay as it is. Yeah. It okay, fine. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I shouldn't have stopped sharing them. It just, it's not, it's not liking my. Uh, it doesn't like you, does it? No, it just doesn't like my presentation mode. It's not liking this. Maybe I need to update Zoom. Anyway, um, so. Here are all the kinds of interventions that my organization currently do. The list is not exclusive. Can you score how many you got? Can you zoom in a bit using the bottom at the bottom? Because I know oh. I can't read that because it's too small. <laughs> Thank you. You'll learn I'm blind to the back. Thank you. I know. It's very, very annoying. Why is it not lying? Why does it not? Yeah, why couldn't I change inbox earlier on from my Celsi profile to my personal profile and log out and then log into Eventbrite? So Don't know. really difficult to do the comparison when there's just sort of general chat. So I will, no. I will run, you, run you through what these things are. Should we do it tag team? I'll do first, you do second. Let's do very, very quick. Yeah. First thing you can do is do price comparison. Generally, all you're doing right at the moment is you're enabling prepayment meters or people who pay by cash to uh, get onto a credit meter. You can apply for the warm home discount, which historically has been £140 going up to £150 this October for a core group of people with the guaranteed element of pension credit. Um, this is and then the broader group for some energy companies, which is generally roughly. Alex, you've got to be quick low incomes and we've got eight uh, minutes left I know, okay, I'm, so you're, you're I'm doing it leave me alone um or um health conditions and low incomes water shore plus 50 percent off their water bills you can give behavioral advice to help people reduce their demand you could look at how teaching people how to manage their fuel debt or make a trust fund application you can apply for priority services so this uh, not only helps people if they have a power cut but also generally gets them treated somewhat better if they're in energy debt. There's places that will pay for new white goods if they are inefficient or broken and a family needs one. You can, you can advocate for clients in disputes with energy companies. You can give information about smart meters and the you benefits. Can refer, you can refer to other local services such as fuel, uh, food banks. Provide emergency heating, which are cheaper to run than um, a fan heater. So you can do a basic uh, safe fire safety check. You can give information of how to program your heating system because so many people still don't know. Um, you could help people apply for major measures. So that's loft cavity wall insulation, external wall insulation, solar PV uh, through one of the funds that are currently available. You could advocate with the tenant or on behalf of them with their landlord. And you can install light measures. So that's radiator reflector panels, LED light bulbs, water flow control measures. How many did you guys get? Out of one, two. Stick it in the chat. 16. Great, amazing. I've just thought of another one. <laughs> amazing. And is anyone, are there, are there any that we haven't listed? No. Love and okay. friendship. Love and friendship. Well, to be honest, quite often you are, it is all about giving people confidence. Um, actually, what you're doing is you're enabling people to. Um... Oh, Helen, we've got a hand up. Oh, sorry. Um, they're just um, draft stripping, which is cheap and basic and elementary. Yes. So I would call that life measure. Life oh, that's measures, the, oh yeah. that's the life measure. Yeah. yeah. 
like uh, I, I would summarize that. So we quite often install letterbox draft, uh, window door uh, draft proofers. Um, I thought of actually explaining people how their energy bill, expect so people can understand their energy bill is a basic yeah. but important one. I mean, so absolutely, you can do it in a very uh, 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 a very top down way where you do things for people, or you can enable them. Generally, the better the, the latter is better. Try and do um, things with them, not to them. Yes. So, types Depend of project. Yeah, go on. Because I want to get onto the exercise. Mm -mm -mm. Well, you do this. Basically, I think most of those on there will be self-explanatory. The one that might be not so familiar is energy cafes, which is basically where you have a pop-up energy advice desk happening in a place where lots of people from your targeting um, might go and hang out. So example, uh, we had a really successful one regularly at Woolwich Library and we get lots of footfall, people just walking past and then you can pounce on people different ways ah. <laughs> um, the other one you might not understand what we mean is by energy champion projects so this is where you train a group of volunteers or potentially staff who are paid um, who are embedded in the community to give the energy advice rather than it being professionalized service where you get your professional energy advisors to deliver the advice you train people uh, to do the energy advice um, often the energy champions are delivering a sort of, they're, de they're delivering the easy wins and referring clients who are complicated, who need advocacy or, or, or um, they need major measures, um, they're referring them to you. Um, and yes, my, my organization has done champion, all kinds of different kinds of champion projects with children in partnership with children's centers. Not just your organization. Not our organisation. Yeah, so. stop saying my. And also, I'm not used to. I'm not used to you being here. <laughs> but even so, it's still not our because it's a co-op. So yeah. we've got um, people like Sobia on the call that have gone on that transition from being a volunteer to a paid advisor. We, I'm doing a project at the moment with uh, um, <laughs> from um, Sydney's group in um, North London where we're working with a community actor at Lordship Lane Hub. We're taking people from the community to train them up to be champions, supported by a experienced and qualified energy advisor and doing regular drop-in sessions and um, for advice for people in the community. So onto the really good exercise, this is the good bit. Well, so we're gonna need to decide whether we do this now in breakout rooms or whether we set it as homework for the next session. Let's do a show of hands who wouldn't mind staying a bit longer to finish the session correctly as we'd planned or who has to leave at eight that would give a good idea for people i have to leave what did you say catherine i just said how long do you need oh, 10 minutes yeah yeah i can say so put your hands up if you can stay or if you would prefer to stay. Okay. Linda's saying in the chat she can stay. Linda. Oh, it doesn't sound like everyone. So how about we set this as homework? So Catherine should have sent you a uh, some exercises. And let me talk you through what the exercises are. And I will... Let me find my exercises. They are currently in the chat. I put them in the chat earlier. Um, yeah, and I will also email. But if you can all open the exercises, and I'll talk you through what the exercises are. So this is where you start making some decisions about exactly what you do, and exactly what you do really is dependent on the particular circumstances um, your organisation is in, and where you're at with your ability and your skills and the ability to cope with complexity and stuff. So. We've given you three different four, four different types of, let me see if I can open them. Have I still got them open on my, on my system? Um, I can open them if you want, if you still. Yeah. So it's a simple matrix. You can see it as a 
graph. So you can go across and think of what sort of things you need to think about and what would be the impact in terms of um, you know, it can make a real difference to people in your local area, but also balancing it with how difficult it might be for, for you or your organisation or your group to make happen. Yeah. So, um, yes, who can see the exercises? Just no. Oh, my sharing isn't working still. No sharing isn't I can't working. believe that sharing. I've just found the exercise and it's not sharing. The yeah. IT gremlins are against us. They really, they, they, they're having, they're having a laugh, aren't they? They are having a blinking giraffe. Let me see if I can override your sharing. All right, do you want to continue? This top one. Sorry for the clock. Great. Right. There we go. Can you see that? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So first thing is just to think about stuff and skills. Um. If you think you need um, a laptop for a workshop, give that a tick. Um, if you think you need a projector for a workshop, give that a tick. Then levels of skill. What different kinds of levels of skill do you need for each of these different types of intervention? Um, you can only give, you can't give all of this kinds, all of these different kinds of support in the context of each, each of these different types of intervention. Have a think about which of these different types of support you can give in the context of each of these different types of intervention. So, for example, it's very difficult um, to give advice about debt in the mm. context of a workshop simply because it's always one to one and tailored. Mm. Um, you could, for example, get everyone to sign up for the priority service register. Yeah. register. So have a think about in which context you can give each of these different kinds of advice. If you could go down a little bit more. So that's the first exercise. And that gets you thinking about all the different types of, you know, how complex it will be to deliver each of these different types of intervention. The second exercise is a matrix exercise, where what I'd like you to do is place each of these different interventions, workshops, energy cafes, home visits, and energy champion program on, uh, on this matrix. So um, you may decide that one type, you may decide that workshops are fairly low impact, but of, um, of uh, relatively simple. Someone's got some background news, so if you could mute it. Sorry? There's some background noise, if everyone could mute. That should say, I've realized under exercises, low, medium, and high. <laughs> Shouldn't say medium twice. The last one should be low, medium, and high. The, the thing you sent is refusing to open because of something contents. OK, I'll email it to you. Thanks. Yep, we'll email it to you. Um, so we've, we've, we've got some gremlins going on. Um, we will yes. not we will not be deterred we will get the word out about how to do fuel poverty projects despite the gremlins so yes. this is a really useful thing to do if you've got any questions about doing this as homework um please email me and i can clarify anything in the meantime so i'll put my email address in the chat so we can sort it out over email if there's anything that you yeah confused about so in fact Catherine will email you because she's got the uh, event bright link we'll email this to you and we'll go over it on the next session all right any final thoughts document before Sorry? You, could you check the document before you do because it was will. it seemed to be a problem in the word document right okay okay i mean the, the, the thing about teams is it's ever so proprietorial it's you know um it was the egress switch thing that trip me up earlier as well yeah so we've got all kinds of encryption and um and barriers to to to, to, to documents in our systems because we deal with client data um yep. and so um our our system tends to we do tend to get a lot of these gremlins so apologies for some of the gremlins you've you've seen today um so any thoughts or questions before we wrap up can we give people a flavor of next week as well duncan um, will next week 
contain the kind of organizational things that yes great that a group needs to know and think about before it goes yes we'll go out there you know like insurance and i can't think of any others but you know yes. safeguarding policies and um such like yes absolutely so next week is far more practical i would say um i mean it's really important that you decide you make some good decisions about what you're going to do so that it meets the need and that's what today was about so that you understood the context next week is really step by step so cool. step one get your board on get your board or your trust your group of trustees on board um or your whatsapp residence group or whatever it is yeah yeah really? we're going to go through monitoring and evaluation safeguarding um insurance um <clears throat> Funding we were going to do today, but we could maybe, we'll and maybe next week. We'll do it next week, yes. And we need to, if everyone could do two hours next week so we could do this properly, it'd be really great. It's scheduled for three. I mean, what? I give up. I'm not playing anymore. <laughs> I just, can you correct that on the Eventbrite? If it, it is on the Eventbrite, it's certainly three in our in our database. It's from five till eight in our database. Yeah. But anyway, it, it, maybe it's just our, our our end the anomaly. But um, the other, yes, I've taken some notes. I will try and tidy them up, and then I will share those in promoting next week. And I, I think if groups are committed to this and are fairly secure that they know they want to do it and what fuel poverty is they can still come they don't need to have been at this week yeah 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 it could it could exist on its own uh in its own way thank you um in its own its own little silo next week mm. and they can always um, watch the video of this or read the notes I'll yeah indeed on our website i just double check catherine um, it said, so it was recording when I entered the meeting, but then a part of the way through after the break, it suddenly said recording on. Does that mean not the whole lot has been recorded? No, so I got kicked out a few times. So every time I got kicked out, it stopped. But I can put together, I can put okay, them cool. together into one video cool, cool. and there'll just be a couple of gaps. So any last questions before we release you back into the wild on this still yeah. light outside Monday evening? I had a question. Oh. next week will you be um providing more information about the difference between like energy champions and cafes and workshops we, or not is that stuff no back? today was really about that so <laughs> i well so let's go very very briefly through because it, it will only take a minute energy cafe energy advice desk yeah in uh, in a public space yeah uh, provided alongside well if you like tea and coffee yeah. uh, and snacks um, um a home visit is where you give the energy advice in the context uh in a home yeah um workshop is where you go to a community group and you give a workshop of maybe sometimes 20 minutes sometimes up to an hour uh where you try and convey some top tips right uh, a champion program is really where you are training a group of people who are embedded in the community either staff or volunteers to deliver the energy advice on your behalf and you're supporting them. Right. Thank you. So, yeah. Um, is my, am I alive? Yes. Yes, I am. Um, do you have <laughs> useful um, crib sheets, checklists for things like a workshop um, so that you would know, right, I'm going to a Victorian terrace. I'd, I'd, I'd talk about this. I'm going to 50s housing. I'd talk about this or just what to cover off in that 20 minutes because that would be so useful as a kind of set of pegs to hang one's thinking on yes sort of i have what kind of modular parts depending on the type of group or cool. like frontline workers is slightly different from you know an M an ms support group for example yeah so i could give you standardized slides personally i don't use slides in the context of the community i do it all verbally um but I can give you some uh, some standardised stuff. In in terms of a home visit, um, it depends on the skills. It really does. 
Um, yeah. And actually, you know, what we have, what we do is, uh, what our energy advisors do has increased um, as time goes along. Um, simply because actually, if you're going to do any advice on major measures, you really need some qualified staff. Yeah. They, pro they probably need to be D at least a DEA um, Le as well as an energy advisor. But we'll talk more about skills, which is, you know, it's an important hurdle to get over. You can't do this stuff well unless you know how to do it. And actually, there's so much to know, actually, if you're going to do the whole shebang. Yeah. The, the other thing is I realised we haven't included at any point is how to keep up to date with all of this stuff because it's so, like it's changing daily if not weekly at the moment it you know I think it just it, it was quite stark actually when we were refreshing the, the content for this like pretty much everything has shifted so it's just like we know this community energy world is always shifting but it's insane how much it has done recently yeah. but yeah there's this kind of pathway as an organization if you've never done like this before starting something with like a pop-up advice desk at, um another event or doing an energy champions program so you're dipping your toe in the water and then as you learn the lessons start to get the reputation get you know some kind of wind behind your sails and all that then you can kind of expand and go out trying to do a full suite what i think of like a full suite energy project with like celsi now we do home visits workshops telephone advice whatsapp um energy advice cafes training frontline workers working skilling up community organizations all of this stuff you try and go from naught to 60 to do that it you um good luck good luck is what i'd say yes so for the low level stuff we can give you models for the higher level stuff it really depends on your skills and you're gonna have to get tailored i guess is the answer to your question brilliant duncan you're on mute Uh, you mentioned DEA. Remind me what that is. Domestic Energy Advisor, able to do an EPC. Oh, uh, yeah, of course. Thanks, Duncan. I was going to Google it. <laughs> and then above that, you've got retrofit assessor and coordinator, and then there's a sort of crossover with the retrofit stuff then. Um, yeah. yeah, and this is why we want uh, our own community energy advice qualification, because all of that list of things only three or four of those are covered in the level three qualification we haven't talked about which is a city and guild qualification run by NEA yeah, yeah. and then below that is a level two for energy debt and fuel poverty Duncan you got a question I'm Bill oh okay he's muted oh, again you're back on mute Duncan <laughs> sorry that was my cue to say that Community Energy England has raised funding from Power to Change to put a cohort of 30 people through the NEA uh, City and Guilds Level 3, plus two trainers who we can then own as Community Energy trainers and um, design our own even better course. Um, so if you're interested in that, we've already got 150 people interested in it. Uh, please go to bit.ly, uh, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash E hyphen advice. I'll email you the link with the document. I'll stick it in the chat. Okay, guys. Oh, I really okay. must. Sorry to interrupt. I, I really must disappear. I'm running late for another. Uh, Thank you. Meeting. Take a look at what I've had to say. I've listened. I've learned. I've taken on board, and I acted on what I know I can deliver for you guys, which is why I've been following you guys for quite some time. So thanks for having me back, and I look forward to speaking to you yeah. next week. Many Take thanks care. for your coming. It's great Take to have care. you, Bill. Take care. Bye-bye. For, for everyone Sorry. else, I hope that was helpful. Okay. I'm going to go. Okay. Thanks, okay. Bill. Thank Bye. you. And we we, we should leave. Um, so, yeah, uh, any, any last comments before we, we sign off? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, thank you very much. It's been it's been a real pleasure tonight.